We stand for the reading. So I've chosen a reading actually from the book of Genesis today. That same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he owned. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Tell me, I pray, your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of his hip. Words inspired by God. One of my favorite verses in the Eucharistic prayer of the cosmos, and it's the shortest actually in the whole thing, it says, God the biologist, we honor you. You who whirl ecstatically around your own image in the double helix of life making, we honor you. So it's, the, it's the, actually the shortest little verse in the whole prayer. Uh, and I remember when I composed that prayer way back in 2007 for our 10th anniversary as a community. And we celebrated, celebrated on the first Sunday of June in 2007. And a few months later, I had another insight. It kind of another vision where this particular verse, out of all the verses in it, there are about 23 verses in the prayer, this particular one, I suddenly realized that, that it not only represented Watson and Crick's double helix that brings life into me, but actually it was the same thing that Jacob experienced in the book of Genesis, what's called Jacob's ladder. Jacob had this experience where as he's in the desert and he's sleeping, he has this vision where there's a ladder comes down from heaven and there are angels coming up and down the ladder. And I realized at that stage that the two legs of this ladder of life, one of them is the love of God and the other is the light of God. And these two call the frame. They're connected in this whirlwind, this double helix where they bring life into being. Not just life on planet Earth, but life throughout the cosmos, or if there are multiverses, that all of life in some senses is a dance between these two legs of the double helix. They are God's love and God's light. And I began to realize that this ladder, this double helix, is a, it's an alive, organic ladder. It's not something that God made one time and then threw off into his storeroom beside his old uh, bicycle that's running down because of the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, and it's not in there somewhere with all of the kind of the, the spare uh, paint tins from when he was finished, you know, painting sunrises, you know, and the petals on flowers, but rather that this is an organic living ladder. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to make four main points this morning. The first one, I want to talk about the story of Jacob. And then secondly, what does it actually mean to wrestle with God? And then thirdly, I call it round number one of the wrestling match, the Garden of Eden. And then fourthly, I want to look at the rungs of the ladder, the kind of the cosmic chakras you know, of this ladder. So let me start with the story of Jacob. It's obvious to me that whatever vision Jacob had of this ladder coming down from heaven, that he was sleeping in some kind of a, what we call in Irish, a chayal oit, a thin place a kind of a portal 
between the worlds or between the dimensions. A place where the, the veil between the mystical and the mundane is diaphanous. And so he's in such a place and he's uh, dreaming and sleeping in such a place. So he has this extraordinary experience of the connection between the, the here and the now and the there and the then. And Jacob understood the significance. And as these beings are coming up and down, there's a wrestling match that takes place. One of these wrestles with him all night long. And finally, as day is beginning to break, this person he's wrestling that says, you've got to let me go, it's daybreak. It's a little bit like Cinderella and the glass slipper. He had to get away before daybreak. And Jacob says to him, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the guy says to him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham and the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And this other person says to him, henceforth you shall be known as Israel. Now Israel literally means in Hebrew, it means the man who wrestled with God. So he's given a totally different title. And when you read through Genesis and this account, sometimes it appears as if this person who's wrestling with him is a man. Sometimes it appears like it's an angel that came down the ladder. And sometimes it feels like he's actually wrestling with God himself. So there's a total significance. There's a shift in identity. When you change your name, you change your self-understanding and you change your purpose and you change your mission. So that's why very often when girls enter convents or boys become monks, the first thing they do is they're given a different name. So they have to, the name has to signify the new understanding of who you are and the new understanding of what your mission is. So he's given this new name, Israel, the man who wrestled with God. So that'd be my first point. What then does it mean to wrestle with God? I think it means that we have to wrestle with our prejudices. We have to examine all the prejudices. You can't uh, grow up in a culture or in a family without drinking in a whole bunch of prejudices. We have to come to a place where we wrestle those to the ground and we begin to see what is, not what we were told was there. We have to wrestle the notions of tribalism, that our group is different from or special than other groups. We have to wrestle that to the ground. We have to wrestle our theologies to the ground. So we have to really examine our cosmologies. We have to begin looking at our idea of who God is for us. Who do you think you are yourself? Who is your neighbor? What do you mean by neighbor? And finally, what do you mean by your mission? And this is a lifelong pursuit, wrestling your cosmologies to the ground and shearing it of everything which is just cultural accretion until you find the core of it. And the core always will be, you, you will discover the mysterious origin from which all forms evolve. You will begin to discover what the legs of the ladder are and the connecting rungs are so that you can bring new life into being in yourself, in your family, in your community, in your nation, and in your world, that that's what it means. It means the ability to see beyond all apparent separation. Because separation merely is in the eye of the beholder. It's an artifact of incarnation. There is no separation between us and God. There is no separation between us and other people. And there is no separation between us and nature. Everything you can experience is simply God in drag. It's another manifestation of the divine. It's an invitation to, to wrestle with God, means to look at the trajectory of the life as it's emerged so far and to continue with that graph. You look at life began with single cells and then they developed into groups that we call organs and then these organs created an organism and then the organism, a person became a member of a family and then a member of a clan and then a member of a tribe, and then a member of a nation, and then a member of a species, and then a member of all sentient beings, but we finally realize that ultimately there is only source, there is only God. So wrestling with God means having the courage to undertake that trajectory, which brings me to my third point. What was the first round in this wrestling match? And I believe that the first round in this wrestling match was getting thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Because in some senses, I don't actually believe that the Garden of Eden is planet Earth or is on the planet. 
I think the, gar the Garden of Eden was in our pre-incarnate form when we understood God and we had to be thrown out of that into incarnation. Rather, we volunteered for incarnation. We volunteered to be thrown out of the garden because we had to develop in various ways. We were not banished because of a sin we committed. We were liberated from beings who only had mere instinct, who didn't have self-awareness or self-reflection. And there's a slight difference between the two. You know, kids become self-aware, you know, in their, at age three or four or five, but they don't become self-reflective until about age 12 or 13. So there's a difference between being aware of myself and being able to reflect on how I'm behaving or how my culture is behaving. So we were thrown out of the garden, not because we were banished for some sin that we'd committed, but because God wanted to give us the gift of free will. God wanted us to experience what it's like to be self-aware beings who would become self-reflective and finally realize that there is only God, that we were being offered the ability to uh, think morally, to self-reflect upon ourselves that this was what, what, what it was about. So round one was the Garden of Eden. And I'm really, really happy that in some senses, we actually won that round. We weren't kicked out by God for a sin. We were blessed by God with the ability to begin the journey back into her heart and into her soul. So I believe that God is like, if you don't mind me mixing my metaphors a little bit, God is like a great chess player, a grandmaster par excellence who loves to play simultaneous games. So God actually is playing a chess match, um, chess match with every single sentient being, any being anywhere, which is both self-aware and self-reflective, is actually playing a wrestling game with God. It is the mission of everybody on planet Earth. We came onto planet Earth in order to wrestle with God, to wrestle with all of these limitations that uh, occlude our vision, and to realize finally that there is only God. That life as we experience it is a dream, as I've said many times. Life is a dream that the ego is having. And the ego is a dream that the soul is having. And the soul is a dream that spirit is having. And spirit is a dream that source is having. So we're literally, you know, we're encapsulated, nested dreams. And our job is to break out of the shell of these confining eggs and to realize that there is only God and we, every one of us, is an articulation of the divine. So that'll be my third point. For my fourth point then, I'm going to call it the rungs of the ladder. So you know if you've studied anything and you've heard me talk about it many times that there's a Hindu model of body which is much, much more sophisticated than our Western version. You know, in the West, we think that our body is literally just the physiology and the anatomy of this, you know, space suit. We're much more complex than that. Hinduism would tell us that there are seven levels of body, each of them vibrating at higher and higher frequencies. And so there's the physical body. There's the etheric body, which is the energy system of which the physical body is simply a hard copy or a printout. There's the astral body that uh, we download our emotions from. The place we go to when we dream at night, or astrally travel, have out-of-body experiences. The fourth level would be the mental body, um, like Plato's idea realm, the place in which we download, you know, ideas, the place of ratiocination. There's a fifth level of body, called the uh, causal body, the psychic body, where we discover our innate abilities in telepathy, precognition, psychokinesis, all of these kinds of things, that all of those are part of the package. Then there's the soul body itself, Atma, which is the bite-sized piece of God that realizes who it is. And then ultimately, there's cosmic consciousness. But I believe that that's true. That model, that seven-tier model, is true not just for individual human beings. I believe it is true of the cosmos itself. I believe it is true for all of life, whether there's a pluriformity of universes out there or just a single cosmos. That there's, this is what... In, it moves all of life through evolution. And so I'm going to divide it then into seven uh, sub-stages. So uh, each of them represents like a chakra. In the human body, there are actually locations where the energy is stepped down. So we become more and more dense as we move from source to soul, 
to causal body, to mental body, to astral body, to etheric body, right down to the physical body. We get denser and denser and denser. And there are locations in the body that act as transforming stations to step down that energy because we couldn't operate with full energy in our physicality. It would blow our circuits. Now, I think the same thing is, is true when I look at the evolution of our cosmos and even of our little planet itself. So I'm going to suggest that there are the seven same kinds of stages. I'm going to name them a little bit differently. So the first one I would call the physiosphere. The physiosphere is the third rock from the sun in our particular solar system. And I had a powerful vision many, many, many years ago where I saw a soul standing in front of God and volunteering for missions. And this great soul, whom I call Gaia, you know, put her hand up and said, I volunteer to animate that third rock from the sun in that solar system and to breed life until I create a life form that will be capable of recognizing both its own divinity and the divinity of all other life forms. And she set about that task 4.6 billion years ago. So this physiosphere, this rock on which we live, even then it was a highly intelligent and complex you know, organism, even though it appeared to be just dead matter. So that would be the first stage, I call it the physiosphere. The next phase then, the next step on the ladder would be the atmosphere. In order to breed this rock and this physiosphere, you know, Gaia had to create a womb, and that womb is the atmosphere. So you had to create a container which could actually gestate life, uh, carry life, and birth life. So she needed to create some kind of a womb that would have carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. They were the ingredients of the womb. So the atmosphere around our planet is literally the womb that allowed life to emerge in stage three. So stage two then, I'm going to call the atmosphere. Stage three then is the biosphere itself. It is the life sheath, all of the different forms. And it began with simple single-celled bacteria that just self-replicated and colonized the planet. And they learned to extract a hydrogen because hydrogen is the most plentiful organism uh, molecule in the entire universe. They could extract it from rocks. They could extract it from any uh, life form, even from water. So they learned to continue by extracting oxygen. Over the course of this evolution, bacteria managed somehow to specialize in various ways. They developed the ability, even single cells. You have about 70 trillion cells in your body, but each one of your cells is capable of respiration, of elimination, of digestion, of sensation and perception. Everything you have as an organism, every cell in your body already has. So that's the gift that bacteria gave us from the biosphere. And there were some beautiful jumps in that process. 545 million years ago, a tiny little critter called the trilobite invented the eye. We didn't invent it as human beings. Millions and millions of years ago, the jellyfish invented mussels. And millions and millions of years ago, it was the worm, the lowly worm, that invented the brain. And so these great breakthroughs, the eye, muscles, and brain, were developed by organisms long, long, long before we arrived. And now the trajectory takes us right up to hominids, Homo sapiens sapiens. So that would be, that's stage number three, that's the, the biosphere the third stage or the third rung on this ladder of life. The fourth one, uh, I'm going to call after Tyler de Shada, the Noosphere. Tyler de Shada was a very famous Jesuit paleontologist who way back in the 1930s and 40s you know, became internationally famous as a paleontologist. And he, he had this idea of point omega, that evolution is moving toward a kind of a Christ consciousness. And he called, you know, he said, there will be a sheath of consciousness that will envelop the world. So you have the physiosphere, the atmosphere, the next sphere around that, then the biosphere around that, and then the noosphere. Noos in Greek simply means knowledge. And so it's a system of consciousness, a sheath of consciousness. It's the place in which information resides, the place from which we, to, to which we upload data and from which we download data. It was the cloud before the cloud was invented. Tyler de Sharda had come up with that. 
It's the uh, place where, you know, uh, the global brain or the world wide web, that's evidence of what he, he was saying. It's also like, it's like a reservoir of water on which we depend for life. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't dump our toxic waste into this reservoir of water, into this re reservoir of data. So we have to be very, very careful that what we're doing on planet Earth is not corrupting it so much that we're, cap we're capable of creating environmental karma at, a, at the level of mind. We have to be very, very careful that the information we're uploading to the cloud and the information we're taking down from the cloud is creating evolutionary shifts instead of mind-boggling mutations. Be really, really careful what we're putting up there and what we're taking down from there. That would be kind of a stage four, the noosphere. Stage five, then, I'm going to call it the anima sphere. Anima from the, the Latin word meaning a soul. So this is like, this is the next uh, uh, sphere. It's the sphere of soul, the soul itself. And the objective of reaching this stage of the evolution is to be able to rediscover your core identity, to be able to... Uh, Disidentify with mere physicality, or emotionality, or even mentation, or even psychic abilities, but the ability rather to identify with who you really are, that you are a soul. And at this stage, you begin to realize that you think a way beyond war, you think a way beyond prejudice, you think a way beyond the notion of separation. You get it that all forms of violence are literally an autoimmune disease. It is the system not recognizing itself, that that's the basis of all violence on our planet. And at this stage of evolution, you get that in the core of your being, that all violence is simply an autoimmune disease, which then leads to uh, rung number six. And I'm going to call that the pneuma sphere. The Greek word pneuma means uh, spirit. Uh, so spirit is kind of the conglomerate of souls. And so this is the spirit sheath. It is the place, it is the unity underlying all of manifestation. It is the place in which waves on the ocean are seen for what they really are. They're not separate ontologically discrete entities that wash up onto a, be a beach and then disappear. They're simply expressions of the one ocean. And you begin to get it at that stage in the pneumosphere that there is only one. And now you've arrived at Christ consciousness, at that realization. There is no separation. There are merely you know, manifestations, a guide in some senses, being an artist and painting different pictures. And then finally, there's the final stage of this journey, um, the causal void. It is the formlessness of nothingness. By nothingness, I mean there's, there are no discrete entities present here. There's just the ability to create anything. So Buddhism would put it like this, they would say, form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. So at this stage, you dissolve the soul itself, dissolves, leaving not a single trace. And for those of, those of us who are still on the lower lung, rungs of the ladder, when we see that happen, we say, oh, the poor soul, he's gone. We think that he's gone. In fact, he's not. What has happened is, once more, the realization that there is only God. So at this stage then, the soul as its final reflection, the soul that used to, you know, in my case, watch sunsets or spiders spinning webs, I who used to listen to the wind or to the waves, I who used to love to stroke the silky lichen on an oak tree or my dog Kayla's coat, you know, I, I no longer have those sensations. Rather, I am God. Not as a unique individual, but uh, Sean has simply been an articulation of that. Johanna has simply been an articulation of that. Samantha has simply been an articulation of that. And now all that's left is uh, the great I am. God, the biologist, we honor you. You who whirl ecstatically around your own image in the double helix of life making, we honor you.